Thank you very much for coming out on this rather wet and wild day. It's been an adventure for all of us, including an adventure here in this new building, which is now officially baptized by gallons of water that's flown all the way through it. So. <laughs> but friends, colleagues, students, visitors, welcome. Very, this is a very special lecture for us. It's an unusual time of the year to hold a public lecture, but we're very pleased that Tom Bloxham has joined us here at the Melbourne School of Design. It's been a, my pleasure to join with uh, Professor Alan Pert, who's director of the Melbourne School of Design, in hosting Tom and his visit here to Melbourne. So my name is Tom Cavan, and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor of Campus and Global Developments. But I begin this evening by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we walk and in which this lecture is taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri, and I pay respect to their elders and families past and present. So tonight, Tom Bloxham will discuss how he established and built the award-winning architectural regeneration company, if we call it that, Urban Splash. And through this, we'll gain insights into the delivery of quality housing and the enabling of urban regeneration by a design-led strategy. Urban Splash was founded by Tom, uh, who's a graduate of the University of Manchester, and Jonathan Falkingham, who's an architecture graduate from Liverpool University. And together, they steered Urban Splash through 22 years, starting off as that proverbial two men in a shed, to a globally acclaimed company, recipient of over 300 awards, which I note includes over 40 architectural awards from the RIBA. And their notable business success um, has played, a, in, in which design has played a central role. So known for transforming urban areas from discarded structures and elements to lifestyle destinations, Urban Splash covers property development, architecture, urbanism, and entrepreneurialism. So in this lecture, you'll hear many of the, about many of their projects, but I'd like to mention one here that sets the scene, perhaps, at least it does in my mind. It's Sheffield's iconic brutalist complex, Park Hill, opened in 1961, designed by Ivor Smith. It was a landmark housing project over a thousand homes at the time. But 30 years later, it was run down, significantly abandoned, and Urban Splash has stepped in and completed the regeneration of the first of the, of the several blocks with plans to follow through on the others. It's a great demonstration of how this innovative thinking can take something which is of so of, um, great cultural importance and bring it back to significance and relevance for us today. So if you visit their company website, as I did, and look at the sales literature for these projects, I think it's remarkable that you read about design. You read about the history and the substance of the architecture, as well as the details of the housing avail available. So the work is placed in a context and given relevance to the community, making it um, enhanced by respecting the design while delivering the product. So here at the Melbourne School of Design, we are concerned about educating designers, including those who, write, who design through writing policy, constructing financing models or delivery logistics, who in the end create the, the worlds in which we will be living. And this approach to design, I think, reflects very closely the attitude of Urban Splash. And so we're particularly pleased that Tom Bloxham has come out this evening um, to talk to us. It's our normal practice in public lectures not to have a question period following, and I hope you'll tolerate that. But there is an opportunity in this lecture to ask questions by email. If you email Alan Pert, whose email was... Slide yeah. oh, slides on the end, all right. <laughs> Save your questions to the end. Alan Pert uh, will receive your questions. And then on Tuesday, Tom Bloxham will be doing, uh, engaged in a discussion with Alan at the M Pavilion. And at that time, your questions will be answered. So it's an asynchronous question time. But please join me in welcoming Tom Bloxham. Well, um, thank you um, very much indeed, Tom, for that very kind uh, introduction. And thank you, University, for inviting us over to Melbourne. It's actually my very first time I've ever been to Australia, and my first time in Melbourne, and I arrived here at 7 o'clock this morning after a 28-hour journey. But it has been absolutely worth it, and what little I've seen of Melbourne so far, I'm thoroughly enjoying, and I think you're very, very lucky to live in such a great city. But I do apologise for bringing the Manchester rain with me today there. 
and I thought it was nice and sunny here. Now, whether I'm going to talk basically about the story of Urban Splash and about some of our experiences in English cities and towns. And to be honest, I don't know enough about Australia or Melbourne to know whether they've got any um, relevance to what you might be doing. But my gut feel from a quick walk around town this afternoon is maybe they have, and maybe there's at least one or two things that are interesting. I was also fascinated to see the exhibition downstairs of Merchant Builders. And there was a lot in that that I really recognised about having a view that what we are building as nations in terms of houses is not particularly exciting or good or fair even to the people who are buying them. And there's a better way of doing things. And actually that um, need to search for a better way of building homes and offices and all sorts of other buildings is both very, very important and very, very necessary. And to make it work, it's more than just architecture or more than just business or more than just profit. Um, or more than just design, but it's an interesting combination of all those things and urban regeneration and public policy and all the other things put together. So for the next um, hour or so, I'm going to uh, regale or bore you with the story of Urban Splash, of how we started, of what we're doing, and show you a few of the schemes that we've done in the UK. Um, just as a bit of background, uh, my day job is what I do day to day, is to um, chair Urban Splash, work there full time, but also in a um, non-executive or voluntary role, I chair something called the Manchester International Festival, which is a festival two weeks every two years, biennial festival of com all commissions of extraordinary new work. Um, perhaps slightly similar to your Sydney festival, but it's all new commissions that goes on every two years, which is great fun. I'm a trustee of the Manchester United um, Foundation, which is a charity run by the football club, and I'm a trustee of the Tate Gallery. So Urban Splash. Uh, Urban Splash is a private business, it's a property company, and it tries to do what it says on the tin, make a splash in our towns and cities. Um, we've completed about 60 buildings um, across the UK. We're based in Manchester, which is a northwestern post-industrial city, but have worked through many parts of the UK, but not in, uh, not in London or the South East. Um, my uh, background, I'm, I'm not an architect. In fact, I'm the least qualified member of our board. Um, there's sort of five or six of us who are surveyors and accountants um, and architects. Um, and my, I studied politics and modern history for three years at Manchester University. And unfortunately, all I learned studying politics was whoever you vote for, the government always seems to get in. And apologies to the politicians uh, present. But while I was at university, um, I um, wanted to make some money. So my first student grant check, and in those days in England, we actually got grant checks to study, uh, it was, which was about 200 pounds, which would have been 1983. I bought a load of records to try to resell. But actually, I bought all the wrong records, and I was spectacularly unsuccessful at selling my records. What I did see is I saw that the students there were living in um, bed sits and student accommodation and there were bare walls, breeze block walls, and there was nothing to put on them. And people wanted posters, and so I started selling posters. And I also found that the poster industry at that stage in the UK wasn't really catering for any of the needs of the people that I knew. My friends were into Joy Division, were into Clash, were into Bob Marley, were into the punk bands, and the posters were being sold by a shop called Athena that stage, and it was like Michael Jackson and that tennis player showing her bottom, and it wasn't the sort of stuff that my mates wanted. And so I had a, quite a good business idea. You were supposed to go into the record wholesalers and buy 100 records and take one poster to stick in your poster shop, uh, in your record shop wall. I bought about five records, took 50 posters and started selling the posters, which ended up being quite a good business because uh, it won't cost me anything. I was then publishing posters and um, buying them off the guys who were supposed to be sticking them on the walls. And at that stage in Manchester, the um, music scene was very, very active. Factory Records was happening, the Stone Roses, the Happy Mondays. And we started doing deals with those bands and actually making the posters for them and selling them at the record, at the concerts. But more importantly, we were selling retail, supplying the big chain stores, exporting them all over the world. But the real money was to actually sell them retail. Because if you exported them, you get about 50 pence per poster. If you sold it wholesale, you get about a pound. If you could sell it retail, you get three pounds. So the secret for me was to get a shop. But I couldn't get a shop. So I was selling them on market stalls. This is in um, Glastonbury. And I had a stall in Portobello Road in Camden Town at, at the student unions. And I couldn't, get a, I couldn't get a shop because every time I knocked on the door of the estate agents and said, can I rent a shop? 
They said, certainly, Mr. Bloxham, can we have three years' accounts and we want to have a look at your covenant? Now, I had no accounts, and I thought covenants were where, where nuns lived. <laughs> so, in the end, I hassled my way and got a very small um, indoor market stall, six foot by two foot, to sell postcards. They wouldn't even let me sell posters. But I was desperate to sell posters, so I kept hassling and hassling the landlord. And eventually, they rented me 6,000 square feet, about the size of this lecture hall, um, which was a disused shop. The previous tenant actually was Georgie Best, and it was on the first and second floor. I mean, one of the interesting things was walking down Mobile today, I saw you've got some amazing retailers here, and you've got some amazing independent retailers. But so often, upstairs, the building seemed empty, which seemed a real waste of space. And it was a case in this building, which was actually retail on the low-grade retail on the first floor, but the second and third floors were empty. So I took the space over, I sold my posters, but I actually found out it was too much space to sell my posters. And so I started um, subletting the space um, to all sorts of other um, weird and wonderful friends of mine doing selling records, selling condoms, selling all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And I ended up making more money by subletting the space than I did by selling the posters. So I thought, hey, I, I must be a property developer. <laughs> a year later, I went to Liverpool, which was just 30 miles away or so, and bought my first building. And I, you know, I bought this. This cost me uh, about 100,000 Australian dollars to buy it because nobody wanted to be in this part of Liverpool. Liverpool, like many northern cities, were going through a crisis, a post-industrial crisis. There were people in the government who thought the solution to Liverpool was to manage decline and thought it had no other future. The same with many other cities in the north of England. Their history had been built on trade, on the docks, on textiles, on manufacturing. Um, and in my mind, the economic history of the UK is, is in some ways very, very simple. In the 19th century, we made all our money by making things, by manufacturing things, by producing things. In the 20th century, we made all our money by trade, by buying and selling things, the great port cities, the great trade cities. And in the 21st century, we're going to make all our money by ideas, by creativity with our mind, though, rather than the else. So it's actually the creative industries was going to generate the wealth. And so inside this building, which I bought very cheaply because the um, Liverpool was in such a poor state, initially it was just downstairs a series of shops and one of the shops was a record shop. And one day one of the guys in the record shop said we need an office space. And actually there were some really run down, disused spaces um, on the upper floors. And for five pounds a week, I rented two guys who were working part time in the record shop a space. And those two guys were called James Bart and Andy Cowell, and they ended up running Cream Nightclub and Cream Records and Cream Festivals. And on the back of that, we then started filling the space up with uh, other bands. On one occasion, there were three bands on top of the Pops, all with space in this building, the Farm, the Lars, Oceanic, with graphic designers, with fashion designers, with some architects, with all sorts of weird and wonderful people using their creativity to make things. And sort of on the back of this, I thought there was something that could be done a bit more exciting. And so, in 1993, on a drunken night, I got together with a guy called Jonathan Folgingham, who was an architect, and thought we'd start a business, initially to do one, to do one scheme called Concert Square. And we said, getting together with this mass of old buildings lying empty in northern cities, together with some great architecture, but also with some innovative leasing terms, not just being fixed to the what was then the normal 25-year foolish insurance and repair and leasing, different leasing terms, we would actually start a business which we called Urban Splash. One year later, we completed the first loft apartment uh, in Liverpool. And it's hard to remember how radical this was, because at that time in Liverpool, 200 people lived in the whole city centre of Liverpool. Liverpool and Manchester and most other English cities have become depopulated people had fled from the cities to the suburbs. And this was really caused by a hundred years before the rich merchants lived in the city centre, but then the factories came in the city centre, the factories billowed out smoke and dirt and noise, and the prevailing winds would tend to be northeasterly, um, and so the north and the east parts of the city were the poor parts, and the merchants fled to the south and the west, and increasingly further out, first of all a mile or two, then five miles, then ten miles and the city became totally depopulated. And sort of, we brought people back to live in the city centre. We did this incredibly cheaply. We were converting this building, I think, for something like 50 Australian dollars a square foot, $500 a square metre on conversion costs. But actually, if you take away the television, it still looks relatively contemporary. 
And not only inside the buildings, right from day one, we were as interested in the spaces outside the buildings as inside the, the buildings. And in this case, we actually demolished a building to create a new town square, the first square in Liverpool for over 100 years. And I'm as interested in the spaces outside the buildings as I am inside the, the buildings. And so I should have said before, and the first few of these slides gives a brief overview of the history, and then we'll go on to some of the projects, the past projects and the future projects. We then moved to Manchester and developed in an area that's now famous called the Northern Quarter. But before it was called the Northern Quarter, it was um, the crappy part of Manchester behind Market Street. And we actually invented the name, the Northern Quarter. It was sort of the northeast part of Manchester. It was going to be called East Side or North Side, but there's a bank called North Side, which I thought was pretty bizarre. So um, someone reminded me, actually, we're in New South Wales. And New South Wales itself is neither New nor South nor Wales. So I think Northern Quarter can be called that in Manchester. And we began to get noticed um, doing interesting different buildings. Uh, this one was actually taken in Liverpool by a building called the Collegiate. And you can just about see the pictures in it. It was a, a, a Gothic Revival Victorian building. And I think what was interesting about this building is we found the original drawings for it. And it's about 100,000 square feet, grade two star listed. Um, and by Harvey Lonsdale Holmes, one of his competition, 23 years old. He only built three buildings. One was in George's Hall, which is held as the best um, Georgian building. And this was Collegiate School. But there were only eight drawings to do it, eight one drawings. And sort of one of, um, a plan of each uh, floor, typical elevations and typical details. And from that, the master builders interpreted the architect to make this amazing building. And we've always used arts and artists in all the projects we've done. This was working with the Liverpool Biennial where we gave them some space. And from moving originally to just restoring old buildings, we went to actually look at, um, do new buildings. And this was the first new build we did in 1999, which was an architectural competition. We ended up picking an uh, unknown architect called Glenn Howes. And we had a competition. We might recognize Richard Rogers, chair of the judges. Um, and then in 2000, we were selected by the government to do the New Islington, which was Manchester's Millennium Village. There was one in Greenwich in London and one in New Islington in Manchester. Uh, won a number of awards. Half our business is commercial, half of it is residential. Uh, 2005, we had a big building called Fort Dunlop in Birmingham. And we've always been interested in the way we build buildings. And typically in the UK, buildings are still built in brickwork which actually hasn't changed for a thousand, more than a thousand years. A bit of brick, wet cement, another brick. Working outdoors in hostile conditions, reliant on itinerant labor. It's you know, quite a very old fashioned way of building things. And we were convinced there must be a better way of building. So in 2006, we were experimenting with our first modular home called Moho or modular home. 2007, very, very focused on brand. What I see around me in the world about me is brands dominate. Our phones, our clothes, our cars, our watches are increasingly dominated by brands. Yet in property, certainly in the UK, there are very, very few brands. And so we got very focused on what Urban Splash meant as a brand. We came with words, you know, it means contemporary, urban, um, value for money, cutting edge, funky, honest, reliable, um, surprising and we were probably a bit too much of our own backsides because then in 2008 um, economic crash I don't know how it affected Australia but certainly in the UK it decimated our industry and particularly um, particularly the northern speculative developers where we were and unfortunately most of the people in our market actually disappeared um, you know and we went from a value or seemed one minute of being worth about 100 million to the next minute being worth minus 100 million and having to cope through um, with that which was quite challenging um, and many people just gave up but actually um, we thought intrinsically um, the product we were doing was good and it was worth fighting for so at the depth of the recession we raised another 50 million pounds and actually, we decided there was a flight to quality. What people were really interested in is what we knew from day one, which was really interesting buildings. And we went back to doing interesting buildings, which we found were recession-proof. This is Albert Mill in Castlefield, Park Hill in Sheffield, and Royal in the Yard. So that's a very brief history. Um, and over that period of 20 years, we've built nearly 4,000 homes, nearly 2 million square feet of commercial space, and we've won nearly 400 awards. And now these are some of the buildings that we've um, done and completed, and then we'll go on to some of the buildings we're working on at the moment. This was the collegiate the school I talked about in Liverpool, designed by a 23-year-old on six bits of paper as a student. 
Um, Smithfield Buildings in Manchester, an old department store, uh, been empty for years, converted back into independent retailers and um, residential on the upper floors around a rediscovered atrium. And what I liked to see in Melbourne was all the independent retailers you've got. And I was quite jealous of that. In the UK, increasingly, we're seeing fewer and fewer independent retailers. In the UK, increasingly, we're seeing a homogeneity of our high streets. The same plastic fascias, the same chain stores, the same mass chains, which make every town and city the same, which I find very depressing. Um, an old, this was a sandpaper factory uh, called Britannia Emery Mills, again, empty for many years, brought back to life. Um, a box called the Box Works, which surprise, surprise, made boxes. Um, an interesting building. Um, an old Polish church turned into a trendy restaurant. And then a series of back-to-back -back Victorian terraces. And these had really been abandoned, and it was quite sad. And the council, trying to do the right thing, started buying them up. And they were being um, petitioned by their constituents, saying, you must do something. And they weren't quite sure what they were going to do, so they bought them up. And they decided they would demolish them. And the local MP, um, who was quite a strong, impressionable woman, sort of said, Tom, can you come and have a look at this? So she dragged me along, and I said, I know nothing about the suburbs. And I said, what are you going to do? She said, we're going to demolish them. I said, what are you going to build in this place? And she said, we're not quite sure. She found some drawings, and I saw some drawings of a very, very depressing cul-de-sac modern house. And I said, well, why are you demolishing them? And she said, well, there's no demand for this type of housing. If you look, the sign says, gone on Nation Street. And that's sort of what happened. Anybody who could voted with their feet and, and left. But actually, many of my mates who are in their 60s grew up in this area. And this area was a nice place for first-time buyers. And then they sort of left because the new Bellway and Barrett homes came in. But actually, then it was a nice place for students to live. And then they built new purpose-built student blocks, and the students moved out. And then it sort of became an increasingly bad place to live, and the sort of the last refuge of the worst type of private landlords. The people thrown out of other accommodation would get housing here. And the people who could move voted with their feet and left. And so I said, what are you going to do? She said, I'm going to demolish them. I said, why are you going to demolish them? And she said, well, I'm told there's no demand for two up, two down Victorian terraced housing. And I sort of questioned that because, you know, five miles away in a district called Didsbury, they sell for £250,000 each. 200 miles away in London, they call them muses, and they sell for £3 million each. But they're basically all two up, two down Victorian terraced housing. And so we came with a, a scenario to restore them, and in many ways, I think they're much more attractive than many new-built housing. And there were a few problems with them. There were problems with the back alleys, which had all built on kitchens and bathrooms, and there was no car parking. So the solution we did was to put the living room upstairs, two bedrooms downstairs with a sunken bath, and actually secure underground parking and a terrace connected with the upstairs living room to sort of reinvent them and turn them, if you like, into loft apartments and terraced housing. And actually, this sparked people's imagination, and people started to get it interesting them. We did a lot of marketing, and someone once observed to me that we were actually a marketing company that happened to sell property, which I disagree with. But again, I think from the exhibition downstairs you saw, you're marketing. With any business, you've got to do two things. One, get the product right, but secondly, tell people about it. And one or the other is never sufficient. You need two together. So we did both of those, and we got it into every national newspaper, and we got people started to get excited about an area of Manchester called Salford that wasn't particularly exciting. And actually, people started queuing up. And in fact, so many people queued up, we had to build a tent. And people were camping for three weeks to actually put the reservations down. And houses that were selling for eight or 10 grand a piece in pubs for cash were now selling for 100, 250 grand for owner occupiers who wanted to live in there and created a nice community. And then a very different building was the Rotunda in Birmingham, above the Boring Shopping Centre. A 60s concrete building, which many people said had come to its end of its life and should be demolished, but it's actually listed. But we thought it was actually a very good building. And I think there are many 60s concrete buildings of real value. And I remember when I was growing up as a kid, people were demolishing Victorian villas because they had rising damp, they had drafty windows, and they had bad electrics. No one would dream of demolishing a Victorian villa today. When I started in business, people were demolishing Victorian warehouses because the property industry said they would never let, ironically because the windows were too big and the ceilings were too high. Can you believe that? Or the loadings weren't big enough, yeah? And yet, I mean, we've had a number of buildings that you can't use that for offices, they won't take the loadings. And then I've shown them old pictures of steam-driven machinery on these floors and says, you're telling me it can take this steam-driven machinery, it can't take a few desks and chairs? I'm sure it can. 
But today, in England, people are demolishing very good 60s buildings because, they say, there are problems with the windows or the services. And again, they can be fixed. So this was turned from a derelict office building into some really interesting residential building. And everything, it was built above a shopping centre, so everything had to come in and go out through that one yellow box. So logistically, it was quite a challenge building it. And then we had a very bad idea, or a good idea at the wrong time, which was to start a chain of boutique hotels. And we started with this amazing building called the Midland Hotel in Morecambe, designed by Oliver Hill, a fantastic Art Deco building, allowed to go into a very sad state of repair, but a building that we thought was wonderful. So we restored it, brought it back in there, some amazing Eregil reliefs. I think the artwork in the building was worth more than the building. Um, Albert Mill, a great old Victorian mill building, traditional loft apartments. Fort Dunlop in Birmingham. If any of you have ever driven from London to Manchester along the M6 or London Glasgow, you pass this huge building, uh, half a million square feet, a building, lied empty for 20 years. It had been owned by Richardson's, which was one of the most established Birmingham developers. Everybody in Birmingham thought if they can't do anything with it, nothing will ever happen. And we had to find a solution for it. And we thought it wasn't sufficient just to give it a coat of paint because nobody believed we could do anything with it. But we converted it, we brought it back into life, and one of the first decisions we did was to build an extension on it, another 50,000 square feet, with a travel lodge, a very cheap budget hotel. But just by doing a very simple design, try, working with the same budget as every other travel lodge, tried to make an interesting design on it. Brought it back to life entirely speculatively and fully let in two years, and has remained over 95% let ever since. And then these are some of our commercial buildings that we've got. Um, building called Matchworks. This was the last match factory. Um, and many other people looked at this and there was a big column structure, quite an interesting concrete structure, built as a match factory, uh, fireproof, the water towers in case uh, it caught fire to put it out. And many people looked at trying to get rid of the columns. You can just about see the columns inside it with very, very expensive solutions to get rid of the columns. So we questioned, why do you want to get rid of the columns? And people said, well, they want open plan office space. And I'm sure a few columns don't matter. And the other interesting thing is, when you do the office space, you need to put um, toilets in, you need to put kitchens in, and they usually block the space up anyway. So our solution was to lose, leave the columns as they were, because it's expensive to take them out, but put the bathrooms and the kitchens on the back in these little pods to make an architectural statement and create some extra space. And it's a series of other new buildings, existing buildings, about a quarter of a million square feet of business park. And then an area now called the Rope Walks, a series of interesting, funky, managed workspace, full of designers, full of creative industries, having a bit of fun with the graphics on the walls, filling it with um, graphic designers, with architects, um, and a few future development opportunities. And in Manchester, Old Victorian, this was a Petico factory, brought back to life. And there've probably been over a thousand companies have actually started in existence from this one building. Very small spaces from 100 square feet, but you can rent it on a monthly license. You can come in, go out easily. If your business expands, it leaves you more space. If your business contracts, you can move into smaller spaces. Um, Walk Mill, one of the earliest mills in a place called Ancoats, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, brought back to life, and an old school converted into offices. Um, some industrial estates, which will be future development opportunities. And I mean, I think you've got the same problem in Australia as we have in the UK, which is housing supply. We're now coming on to some housing projects. And the problem is, is the green line says how many houses we're building, and the blue line says how many houses we need. And in the UK, we're, we need approximately a quarter of a million new homes every year due to populations growing, people are living longer, um, people are marrying later, divorcing sooner. I'm never sure they're the same people or different ones. Um, and there's net immigration coming in there. And all of that is putting pressure on our housing stock. Yet we're building very few homes. But actually, residential property, perhaps because of that, has been a great investment on asset class as a rental uh, property, better than anything else. But in the UK, very, very little of it is owned by institutions. So what we're trying to do is work on a big, what we're calling PRS, private rented sector, to build up a stock of rented apartments to hopefully attract institutional investment. So as well as people um, investing in property of their own ownership, so institutions will, to encourage more homes to be built. And we've got about 800 units in our portfolio. And these are some of the um, schemes we, we built them in. This was in Manningham Mills in Bradford in Yorkshire. Now this is in Manningham, and Manningham is a poor cousin of Bradford. 
Bradford's the poor cousin of Leeds, and Leeds is arguably the poor cousin of Manchester, which is arguably the poor cousin of London. So it's fairly way down the pecking order, yet it was this amazing um, textile mill where they invented velvet um, and silk, and listers who owned it made an absolute fortune, as you can see from the size of the building. But it was in a fairly bad state of repair, and it went into receivership, and the receivers let it to somebody. And I said, why have you let it to this particular company? And they said, well, we've let it them for security to look after the building. And the company they let it to was an architectural salvage company who systematically ripped out everything of any value from the building and sold it. And so we bought it and we paid 35 pence a square foot for the freehold of it. And we probably overpaid for it. Um, and then there were some disturbances nearby. But the old buildings were great old buildings and brought them back into use, brought them back into life and changed the headlines, filled them with people. And actually, quite interesting, on the roof, we were working on these pods with an architect called David Morley um, to bring people back in there. Very different building type. Old 60s tower blocks, council flats, even as council flats, Manchester City Council said there was no demand for them. But we show by recladding, remarketing, doing the interiors, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with them, and they're great shells. And what a waste it is to demolish them. You know, we complain about plastic bags going to landfill, but how many you know, millions of tons of landfill will it take to demolish these perfectly good shells? And also some new build. This is a building by Will Olsop called Chips, supposedly because Will saw three chips on the plate and said, well, um, name, build a building like it. But I think what it does do, this was a very, more of this later, I mean, it was a, in a very bad estate, and we had to do something big and brash to change the perception of it. And I think for quite a tall, nine-story building, it gives it a bit of humanity and a bit of fun. And then Lakeshore in Bristol. This was the first use of Core 10 steel in the UK. Design is the headquarters, the office headquarters for the Imperial Tobacco Company, but lying empty for many years. Uh, uh, artificial lake, it was built above an artificial lake, very, very ambitious at the time, the proverbial rusting bike at the bottom of the lake. But brought back to life, restored, put three new atriums in, this was done with an architect called George Ferguson, who's actually now the mayor of Bristol. And a beautiful lake, artificial lake. Staley Bridge, part new build, part conversion. And Saxon Leeds, again, old slab built 60s blocks. Very bad condition, but reclad, kept the concrete structure, and big grounds here, nine acres of grounds. So there's enough space to put allotments in there so people can grow their own veg to have a garden so people can kick a ball around with the kids, to have a barbecue, to have some fun. Um, some other new build, Moho, Timber Wharf, spin through these. And then Park Hill, and we had a bit about Park Hill earlier on. Um, and this is Park Hill in Sheffield, which is a project we're on at the moment. And this was, in the 1960s, this they believed was the utopia, the answer to the housing problems. Part of the slum clearance post-war um, Ivor Smith, as a young graduate student, got a job employed by Sheffield City Council to design this amazing set of buildings. But again, through bad management, through bad allocation, um, which we won't go into here, but basically people who didn't necessarily want to live there were forced to live there. And this was a typical scene there that became synonymous with drug taking, with antisocial behaviour, and seen as a slum and seen as the last place anybody wants to live. The consensus in Sheffield was it was an eyesore, should be demolished, but some people thought it was a building worth saving, and in the end, English Heritage listed it, which prevented the council from demolishing it. And they had a competition to try and restore it, and we won the competition and have brought it back to life. But it's like a huge castle above the railway station in Sheffield, Park Hill. It is a park on a hill, like a castle on the hill, and it's what makes Sheffield different from Leeds or Manchester or any other city, so we thought it was worth saving but a huge goliath of a block, over a thousand homes, but the ability to create a whole new quarter in Sheffield. We like this bit of graffiti, I love you, will you marry me? And how do you change these spaces? Well, many of you studying architecture will understand these things. It's not just about building pretty buildings, it's about place and community and how buildings work, and the difference between private and public space and the uses you need to inject into them. And where are we up to? Actually, it's been totally reclad. And here again, we had to make some big decisions. We had to make some big moves. We had to show people that it was changing. So a big new staircase 
there were sort of 12 equal staircases that each one was difficult to manage, difficult to maintain, difficult to secure. We turned those down to one main staircase, a very clear hierarchy of the way in, the way out, the security of the concierge. A big new six-story atrium to make a really impressive entrance, not a dingy way through. Different cladding, different colours, showing people that something's happening, changes about, this is not the old Park Hill, this is the new Park Hill. And a very interesting elevation and a very interesting floor plan. I mean, some people love it, some people hate it. I like all sorts of architecture. I love Tudor buildings, I love Georgian buildings, I love Victorian buildings. I like good buildings, I dislike bad buildings. And this one I would argue is a good building. There's lots of things that make it good. A very interesting plan, or a section I should say, basically the colours show one flat. So you, that's one flat, that's one flat. So you enter every flat from every third floor level and you either go upstairs or downstairs. And that does a lot of very clever things. That means every flat is double aspect. You know, these so-called modern luxury flats have all got a single corridor with flats off both sides. Every flat here has got a south-facing living room. Every flat has got through ventilation. Every flat, even one bedroom flat, is a duplex. And these were built as social housing. Every flat has got full height windows. Every flat has got outdoor space and typically two or three balconies outdoors. Every flat has got exposed concrete. In the same way you expose brickwork in a Victorian lift, in a Victorian loft, why not expose the concrete in a 60s building? And these were selling from um, between £100,000 to £160,000. So very affordable. And the bit of graffiti we quite liked, and for £2,000 we made it into, I wasn't going to say an artwork, but made it a bit of fun. I love you when you marry me. But not just the homes, that's only part of it. It's then about filling the lower floors with some really interesting space, a nursery for the people who live there. Uh, art gallery, what was the second most dangerous pub in the UK called the Scottish Queen is now an art gallery. And space for a whole series of creatives, filmmakers, um, graphic designers, communication agencies, um, architects, all sorts of interesting people uh, filling the space up. Landscaping, event space, um, car parking. And really that's only the beginning of the first block, but what next? And thinking about this is about creating a whole new quarter of Liverpool. And we weren't the first people to think about what next for Park Hill. This was a book done in 1996 by Cedric Price, Andrew Saint and David Meller, thinking about what the future of it is. And we really thought about it, looked back at our old master plans and looked back at the vision. And it was very interesting. I was lucky enough to have dinner with Ivor Smith, the original architect. And I asked him the difference between now and then when he was working in the 60s. And he explained to me, which really struck with me, that he was working in the 1960s. In the 1960s, we were coming out of the war. We were coming out of the rationing. The space race was on. Science was sorting all our problems. Life was getting better and better. Everybody was optimistic. An architect's job was to make people's lives better. And we seem to have lost a bit of that culture. We lost a bit of that idea. And now people in the UK anyway seem to only worry about nets and grosses and getting things on budget and how we tend to things. And I think it's very important we keep focused on actually the purpose of architecture is fundamentally important. But it's not just architecture, it's all sorts of other soft things. And this is sort of a 10-year journey, you know, from we persuaded the Arctic Monkeys, a pop band, to wear t-shirts saying Jetain Park Hill. We took it to the Venice Biennial of Architecture. We got the BBC to make films about it. We got Channel 4 to make films about it. We got it on the cover of Blueprints. We got films made about it. All sorts of soft ideas, soft marketing to create and change the way we think about spaces. We got a shortlist for the Sterling Prize. And so now we're thinking about what next, uh, to quote the Human League also from Sheffield, don't leave me this way. And we think it should be not just a building, but a whole new quarter of Sheffield, tied together with great landscape and a sculpture park. And a new cultural hub. You know, more and more jobs coming from the creative industries and Sheffield's underrepresented. So we're trying to work some partners and make a new Kunsthalle for um, Sheffield. It's underweighted with the arts compared with Manchester or Leeds or even Wakefield. And we've had a whole programme of art performances there, temporary theatre works, parties. We had the Art Council of England do a show called British Modern Remade of Sculpture to place Park Hill in an area of art rather than slum. Photo shoots. Y Cube Gallery did this mad tangerine dinner where everything there was tangerine coloured. Um, beautiful and brutal and beautiful exhibition. And so we want to set it up as an art centre, working with the university, putting workshops in there, putting cafes in there, putting galleries, um, making, bringing life to it. 
and space for making art as well as just showing art, which I think is very interesting. And of course, more great homes for rent and for sale and some student accommodation. So we're halfway through this, and it's actually about celebrating this concrete. People have been sort of hiding the concrete, but all of a sudden now mid-century modern is becoming fashionable again. So let's shout about the concrete and make a new quarter of Sheffield. And let's get the same enthusiasm and excitement that Jacqueline and Ivor Smith enjoyed half a century ago. Other buildings we're doing new is another phase of Lakeshore in Bristol, Smith's Dock, a big old dockyard in the northeast. Um, working on these, we're calling smoke houses actually. Um, hopefully get a bit of work in the next phase of the Olympic Park. And we just won uh, 1,100 homes in Birmingham called Ignil Port Loop. And another interesting scheme we're doing, which is Royal William Yard in Plymouth. And I said like all sorts of different types of buildings, much earlier set of buildings, it's this whole peninsula, which was an old naval yard. It was a victualling yard. So the buildings are called Mills Bakery, where they made the bread, Brew House, where they made the beer, Slaughter House, where they killed the cattle, and the Royal Navy ships came in and were refueled. But then it went through a very sad period of decline. It was empty. It was owned effectively by the um, local authority. They were trying to get people to come and visit it, they said, but actually they had a sentry on duty, nothing inside, a sentry on duty and a barrier down, and surprise, surprise, nobody came in. And so our job was to bring it back to life, to fill the buildings up. And in a way, putting the apartments in there was the easiest part, because they were beautiful buildings, and they allowed themselves naturally to be converted to some amazing apartments, um, working very sensitively, keeping the best of the old, Whenever we add something, we always try to make sure anything we add looks not like pastiche reproduction, but like it's been added in the 21st century, but respecting everything that's good about the old parts of the building. And not just on the actual interior of the flats themselves, but the other thing that I think is really important is the way you enter the flats, the common areas. And again, I'm so depressed to see so many modern blocks of flats where you go through a really mean entrance, you've got nasty corridors and no light. And actually, let's have some joy when you enter a place, let's have some nice staircases, let's have some joyous communal areas, like we see in this building as we go through the middle of the atrium. So we very much try to make a joyous entrance to each of the apartments. But actually, both of those were the relatively easy part. The difficult part was bringing visitors in. And that was all about attracting restaurants and commercial uses to the place. And we've attracted a whole load of um, uses. In particular, we've got nine different restaurateurs there. And we filled it with space with the Plymouth University, with the art school in there, with a whole load of new young businesses, uh, with a new marina. But more, perhaps more interestingly, nine new restaurants. Wagamama's, Sacco, Hugh Fernie Whitten Stores River Canteen. And not a single one of these restaurants was actually represented in Plymouth. And no restaurateurs from Plymouth would come into this space because it was on the wrong side of town. And now the same restaurateurs who wouldn't come here complaining it's taking all their trade away. Every one came from other parts of the UK which were hand-picked and brought in there. But using the great spaces and showing them off and wine merchants. And we're also running a food market every month. Uh, we run a crafts market there. We actually have all sorts of different ways to get people in there. We put on circuses. We put on events. We put on theatre. All sorts of weird and wonderful things. Art shows. We put the British art show in there to bring people into the space. And to get them there, we got our own ferry, which brings them in from the Barbican. We opened up the southwest coast path if you want to walk there with a new staircase. Is it a staircase or is it a bit of sculpture? Doesn't matter. New car parking in a secret wall garden. We've got a bike hire where you can hire a bike. We even come by paddleboard if you want to come by paddleboard. But different ways of bringing people in there. Planting wildflowers and some more space to go. Artist studios and some more space to go. We're not finished yet. And we just acquired this um, brute of a building, the Civic Centre in Plymouth. Uh, Stubbs Mill, an old Victorian mill, lying empty for many years, converting this into 30,000 square feet of managed workspace for the creative industries on site with us at the moment. And this is an area called New Islington. This is the last scheme I want to show you, but an interesting scheme. And it's some more here about the housing that we're thinking of. So this is a joint venture, like many of our schemes, between the public sector and the private sector, working here with the central government in the Homes Communities Agency, with the local council in Manchester City Council, and with the Housing Association. And it's all about a very simple thing of trying to turn one of the worst places into Manchester into one of the best places in Manchester. 
And it was one of the worst places. It was a 1970s sink estate, and quite literally it was built in a hole in the ground so you couldn't even see it. Yet, it was only 400 metres from the central railway station in Manchester, which links it to London. So it's quite incredible, really, that it was allowed to deteriorate so badly with all the problems of boarded up houses, joyriders, antisocial behaviour, and life chances for kids like Raf growing up here, not particularly good. So what do you do to change this? Well, in life, my big experience of life is you don't try to tackle weaknesses, you build on strengths. And the strength of the area was two great canals, one either side of it. We did a very simple master plan, working well also of connecting the two canals with a new canal. And so for a stage, we were the biggest canal builders in the UK. <laughs> we drew a plan to show what it's going to be like. We made models, very impressive. And we did paintings, and I say paintings rather than drawings. We're never going to say that every building is going to look like this, but it was something to get people excited, to show the ambition, to say that this area that was a slum can be turned into something that's going to be exciting, it's going to be different, it's going to be one of the best places to live in Manchester. And we put in public infrastructure the best quality, a new park, a new marina, houseboats. First new park in Manchester City Centre for 100 years. And we had huge problems with the council of saying, well, who's going to maintain this? And if the council's going to maintain it, you need adoptable standards, which basically means using the same street furniture as every other park and not doing anything interesting. And so the solution, the radical, crazy, modern solution, was we employed a park keeper called Ben. <laughs> um, used artists to do everything from manhole covers upwards. Used um, you know, street lighting, so when you're driving down the road, it looks different. You can tell you come into a new area. Big emphasis on sustainability, on bioremediation. We allowed the um, existing residents, we gave them a promise all of a, of a new house in exchange of their old one on the same terms, and we let them actually design their own houses. And what was interesting is we came up with a shortlist. And the first shortlist we came up with was a relatively safe list of good contemporary modernist architects. Manchester ones, people like Mills, Bowman Levy, uh, Roger Stevenson, Ian Simpson, some of you may know. I looked at the shortlist and I thought, hold on a minute, these residents are going to think all these um, crazy, modern, wowed architects. So I looked around and thought, who's the craziest, wowed architect I know? I thought I'd put fat on the shortlist, fashion architecture taste. And of course, who do the residents pick? Fat, um, the crazy ones, because they said they listened to them. And although the buildings look a bit wild on the outside, actually it's only facadism, behind it is a very, very rational floor plate. And other ones by Demetz and by May Architects. A new clinic. We're sponsoring a new free school with Manchester Grammar School. One of the best independent schools is sponsoring a new free primary school. Um, we'll also have ships building. 44 houseboats, which people live on. So creating a whole new environment, and one of the things we're doing here is building new built houses. And um, this, I think, could end up being 70% of Urban Splash's business in five years' time. And for a long time, we're looking at a house, and the number of things drive, drove us to look at housing rather than big conversions. One was the economic crisis of 2007 and 2008, and actually, to do great big refurbishments, you need to raise 50 or 60 million pounds to do the whole building before you can sell a single one. That became increasingly difficult. The other thing we noticed was all our purchasers were getting some money, having kids, growing richer and older, and moving. And none of them were buying new build houses. They were all buying old Victorian and Georgian terraces. And they're doing the same thing, knocking all the walls down and putting in temporary bathrooms and kitchens. And so we thought, why can't we do something like that? The third thing I noticed was grand designs, you know, where everyone wants to build and design their own house. But to do that, you need to be a millionaire and take three years out of your life. So we were thinking, how can we build something that's contemporary and modern? And having looked at all sorts of weird and wonderful bubble houses and various other designs, we came up with a house that looks like a house with a pitch roof and square windows. And our aim is to create a new brand, a designer brand of housing. I suppose if we're being really ambitious, we want to be like the Apple versus the IBM, um, a new contemporary designer brand of housing compared with the mass house builders. And also allow people to put their own personality into it and design it themselves. So it's designed by you, but built by Urban Splash. So what's out there? I mean, we're probably being a bit unfair to the UK house builders, but none of this is particularly inspiring. And nothing's really changed for 50 years, or, or very little's changed. There are a few exceptions to it. And I say poor quality design, it's not true. What the house builders are brilliant at 
is cramming as many rooms as possible into the smallest amount of space. In the UK, they don't even tell you how much space they're selling you. Um, poor specification and it's cellular. Usually, if you knock a wall down, the roof falls in because the party walls are supporting the roof. Something that's actually flexible, and it's not actually about the number of rooms, it's about the number of square feet you've got. Something that's flexible and big, with high ceilings and big windows. And the house builders are also very, very good at building very, very cheaply. But that takes them down a path that makes the rooms ever smaller, the floor to ceiling ever shorter, the windows ever smaller. So we want to do something that's different, that's flexible, that's spacious, that's light, that's open plan, and to build it for around £100, um, what's that, about 2000 Australian dollars per square metre. And doing terraces. Terraces work. They've worked for ages. But also let people to personalise it. In the same way, if you want to buy a car, you may decide you want to buy a BMW 3 Series. But then you've got the choice. Is it convertible? Is it estate? Is it petrol? Is it diesel? What colour is it? Um, you know, all sorts of four-door, five-door, two-door. And so the core themes are, again, about design, about being an architect brand. You buy the space, not the rooms. You decide how you want to live. The quality of the space, eco-friendly, very well insulated. And so the inspiration was our great Georgian and Victorian terraces. So very simple principles, 500 square foot floor plate. Our middle zone is all the surfaces, front and back for living and sleeping. Staircase, wet surfaces in the middle. And just by having the party wall in six different places, you get a huge variety of room sizes. You can specify what sort of room size you want. And so you go through the purchaser, a series of questions, and just by asking a series of questions, they design their house. Because if you can say design whatever you want, it's too much choice, people can't cope with it. But actually, typically, three questions. How much space do you want? A thousand square feet on two stories or 1,500 square foot on three stories? How do you want to live? Are you a garden liver? With the living room downstairs, with a relationship with the garden, and the bedrooms upstairs conventionally, albeit with exposed roof trusses? Or are you a loft liver with the living room upstairs and the bedrooms downstairs? How many rooms do you need to live in? One, two, or three to sleep in. So the choice is yours. So for instance, on a three-story model, if you're a young couple, you might get this one. A very basic kitchen that you can stand later. Your bedroom, spare bedroom, open plan living room. Same house plan, you've got a load of kids. Your bedroom, spare bedroom, four bedrooms of the kids, separate TV room, separate living room, big kitchen. Or any variety. You pay your money, it takes your choice. And what sort of specification? What sort of kitchen do you want? What sort of bathroom, colors? Finishes, this space here could be a utility room, it could be open plan, or it could be a home office with furniture made to measure. So the first 44 are in Manchester in a traditional um, terrace pattern, but they're built in a factory. And why are we still building things out in the open, in the rain, using itinerant labour, um, and why not build things with the same people continually building it? Why not look at those models car manufacturers use a continuous improvement? of actually building things in factory conditions, getting a higher quality. It's a timber cassette system. All the ex party walls, the external walls are structural, so there's no intermediate structure. They come floor by floor, get delivered on site, craned into place. And I mean, the cladding can be anything. Uh, we've used a, on this particular time, a slate tile, but it could be timber, it could be stone, it could be brick, um, arranged in a terrace. Um, we're selling these for £200,000 for two-storey and £300,000 for three-storey and we can do them for that price anywhere in the UK clearly because we're building them in a factory and that's with a modest land value. And a very different look and feel to most new built houses. Open plan, exposed roof, huge windows you can stand up in, contemporary kitchens, windows you can sit in, protruding bay windows, uh, we think there's no need for heating at all, but we put in very small electric heaters. And we think this could have a really broad appeal, and we're really quite excited. And 20 years ago, when we started talking about loft living in the city centre, no one really believed us, no one knew it was going to work or not, and it was very novel. But it's sort of butterflies in our stomach thinking it might work, and we've got the same sort of excitement now. And we want to market it in a very different way. And if you look on the website, we've got some great little laminations and films, how we sell it. We're doing the first one, as I say, in New Islington. Uh, we've got another 34, just got planning in North Shields, in a Crescent. We've got 170 going up on the River Irwell in Manchester. And eventually we want to bring out a range of products like this. 
And again, a bit like the exhibition we saw downstairs, or like BMW got one series, three series, five series, seven series. So eventually we want to have a terraced house, um, we want to have a detached house, we want to have um, a mansion house, but also different houses by different architects. If you're into great chairs, you go to Vitra, you buy it by Frank Gehry or Werner Panton, or if you're into kettles, you go to Lessey and get one by Gehry or Michael Graves or Aldo Rossi. And so we want to work with lots of different designers. And if you like our Mark II model is Mansion House. And Mansion House really is a, um, a modern version of an old Georgian Mansion House. So it's a building where perhaps 10 people live, a medium density building rather than 200 people. So you get to know your neighbors, it's quite intimate. Typically it's above retail or above ground, five, six stories arranged in squares or crescents or terraces, typically two apartments per floor, or it could be one. So what else to say, just coming to the end now, um, a lot of this is only achieved by working in partnership. Uh, the only way I've got anywhere in life is surrounding myself, both of my colleagues, brighter, better, cleverer than me, and also working with partners. You only do so much working by yourself. So all sorts of partners. Um, and I think the difference between Urban Splash and many other um, developers is two things really. The first one is the commitment to architecture, and the second one is taking a large scale view. So many developers seem to just want to get in and get out in the shortest possible time and not care about what happens afterwards. Um, there's a book you can buy, or all this is on our website by the way, if you want to ha have a look at this in your own time. Uh, follow us on the website or follow us on Twitter. And the last slide, but the most important slide. This was an oath sworn by the citizens of ancient Athens. And before you became a citizen of ancient Athens, you have to swear this oath, which incidentally you can only do if you were an Athenian, a free man, over 30 and male, which I discounted 90% of the population. But if we leave that aside, the oath I liked. We shall leave this city not less, but greater, better, and more beautiful than was left to us. Which I think is a fantastic thing to say. And I think all of us can actually do something. Now that might be picking up a bit of litter, it might be joining the uh, parent-teacher association in the school, but for those of us who are privileged enough to work in the built environment, I think it's really important. I'm passionate about all forms of art, and I think you know, art is what separates us from animals. But actually, if you don't like a painting, don't buy it. If you don't like some music, don't go to the concert. If you don't like a film, use your remote control and turn over. I've got no time for that sort of censorship of any sort of form of art. But the thing with architecture is compulsory. We all have to walk past our buildings, we all have to look at our buildings, we have to work and live in the buildings. And there's so much mediocrity in the world, and there's so much is driven, not by making the world a tiny better place, but by all sorts of other drivers, which I don't think, you know, and I think by doing this, you'll actually have a better economic impact. And so I think all of us who are privileged enough to work in the built environment, and in fact all of us can hopefully swear this oath and leave our towns and cities a little bit better than we found them. Thank you very much for listening to me. Tom, that was a remarkable tour de force. When they, we started with 400 slides in the, uh, in the carousel, and I did wonder how we were going to get through it, but you did a a remarkable job of taking us through an incredible story and setting the bar very high. You've shown us how the, all the plethora of decisions that need to be made in order to provide housing and make cities, if they're driven with a particular thing in mind, can lead you to a good outcome. So thank you very much for that. We had said that there would be no questions tonight, but there, there will be answers on Tuesday. No difficult questions. <laughs> you got a whole weekend to think through the answers. <laughs> so, please do email the questions. I'm sure there will be many coming out of this. Just the simple question of how do you get this done is a good one. So thank you very much for the talk this evening. It's, it is a great inspiration to us. It sets the bar high, and it challenges us to think about what else we could be doing in each in our own way. But please join me again in thanking Tom. Welcome. <laughs>